Recording in progress. Uh, different traditions that has he has trespassed through. All that has been uh, taken up as a theme, and we have the best people who are presenting before us in this short span of three o'clock to five o'clock. We have just two hours with so much of knowledge uh, bibing in. Today, the topic goes for Ayurveda practice, in which. Uh, to begin with, Krishna Kumarji has always wanted Ayurveda to be in the mainstream medical practice. And uh, he has uh, conducted uh, on as part of being AVP, uh, uh, Sharanya Ayurveda Hospital, all that has been part of inculcating uh, different types of practice knowledge and also uh, helping in the uh, Ayurvedic physicians for a betterment in the practice. And that has been done through various seminars and conducting workshops. It was uh, both online, offline was possible. And it was taken up only by the push of Krishna Kumarji. Today, when we start with Ayurvedic practice, we have the best people on the session, uh, starting from Tanuja Madam to uh, Girija Madam, then uh, Jay Krishnan Sir, PM Muni Krishnan Sir, and Vinayak Padigal Sir. Uh, we also have the Patnar Association of uh, today as the Ayurveda Hospital Management Association, represented by Dr. Vijay Nangeli, who is the president, and Ayurveda Medical Association of India, represented by Dr. Raja Thomas, who is the president. Private Ayurveda Medical Practitioners Association represented by Dr. Vijit KV, who is an executive member. Today, as we go on to the session, we first begin with the inaugural address by Professor Dr. Tanuja Manush Nesri, who is the Director, All India Institute of Ayurveda. Uh, the Director, All India Institute of Ayurveda, an autonomous uh, organization under the Ministry of Ayush. She is a seasoned researcher professor and expert on Ayurveda. Besides looking after the Ayurvedic education and the growth of the students, she has also contributed to overall propagation and advancement of Ayurveda significantly over the years. And she is one person who has always been attached with AVP and Krishna Kumarji for quite a decade. So over to you, ma'am. We have the inaugural address presented by you. Namaste. My pranam, am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay. Namaste. Uh, all the, uh, at the outset, I would like to pay my sincere tribute uh, to late Sri Pad Krishna Kumarji, a very legendary personality, uh, a noble uh, human being, academician, citizen practitioner, great administrator and overall uh, the visionary organizer and uh, all uh, what we can say that it was a versatile personality uh, which we can very well see that as a role model and uh, as someone told on the beginning of the day uh, beginning of this workshop that uh, guru tatva is always vibhu so he was guru nam guru and uh, the one, his thought and his message and the learnings, I think, will keep us going. So my pranam to uh, Vaidyaraj uh, Krishna Kumarji. And we congratulate uh, the organizers, AVP, uh, for organizing this very, very thoughtful uh, as a down the memory lane and very, very thoughtful uh, uh, sessions and the webinar on each topic because he was really the great uh, physician, uh, academician, uh, educationist, and a visionary leader. So on every day, uh, the topics are very, very thoughtful and of a, uh, great uh, personalities and religions. So my pranam to everyone and congratulations. And I just, uh, I, I'm really feeling, uh, it's my proud privilege and I'm honored to be part of this session and as a being offered, giving me chance uh, for inaugural address. So thank you very much for having me here uh, on this uh, platform and the panel of very, very learned and esteemed physician. And my pranam to uh, Dr. Uh, Girija, uh, Dr. K.T. Uh, Jai Krishnan, Unni Krishnan, and all the uh, Vinayakji, Padikal, 
and the representatives of um, Kerala uh, Ayurveda associations, medical associations, and all the esteemed physicians and Vaidyaraj, my pranam to everyone and the audience. Uh, that's the topic itself is a uh, interactive session on Ayurveda practice. And it is said that uh, in this COVID pandemic for last uh, two years, what we have witnessed is uh, the importance and awareness about uh, Ayurveda, not only as a prophylaxis, but as a chikitsa in the management and post-COVID management, everyone has understood. And when the ministry, uh, where I'm representing the All India Institute of Ayurveda, as a tertiary care hospital and ministry also uh, the, just un uh, conducted a review uh, and on through e sanjeevani app that how many people of india uh, citizens of india have used ayurveda and ayush systems of medicine during this pandemic time uh, so uh, more than it the review says the state that more than 87% of the people of india they are using some or the other uh, ayurvedic medicine not only as a supplementary prophylaxis as an add on as a standalone or a post treatment um, follow up and as a immunomodulators so now uh, even though we can say that uh, even though after 2 years even though there is no concrete solution but the chikitsa sutra as what all chikitsas offer uh, to each and every one and who, to whom, uh, whom uh, the patient they came across and to person who wanted to prevent the COVID by themselves and prevent the severe or severity and the mortality. Uh, so uh, it has one thing is uh, very much sure uh, that uh, this pandemic uh, has proved to be a, there is a blessing in disguise because uh, in 200 years, uh, this was the first time the situation is arised that not a single pathi uh, has could provide a concrete solution and everyone started and beating in the bush and with the empirical evidence. But we were the one that we developed the consensual document of involving 6,000 physicians across India and the practitioner's guideline was floated by ministry and I'm really um, happy and proud feeling uh, that at All India Institute of Ayurveda, uh, we started COVID Health Center and 600, more than 600 patients were standalone treated with holistic Ayurveda management. It is not only single herb, single drug, single formulation, but it is a holistic, like it includes um, Ayurveda um, management, like a uh, it is said that program Ado Parikshet Tato Anantaram Aushadam. So we uh, uh, started initially in the phase one. It was uh, Jwar, Agantu Jajwar, Sannipata Jajwar, Kapha Atta Pradhana Jwar, Pittanu Bandhi Jwar. And then it is Rakta Dushti and what is Visayashan. And when it was second wave came, then the diagnosis, then Ayurveda Nidan, program Ado Parikshet, the Samprapti leading to Janapadod Vamsvyati and it is Agantuj Parivartit in the Nijavyati. Then it led to Shwas, Kas and then followed by it was considered as a Raja Yakshma and Raktopitta. So with all those understanding, integrating all those um, presentations, Hetu, Linga and Aushada, considering the Hetu and the Linga and then the Chikitsa Sutra as Aushad was determined. And then we got the holistic as a Aharam Iti Aushadam. So Ahar, Panchakarma, Aushad, Yog, uh, and then a lifestyle and physical, uh, local and general measures we decide to use. What I would like to highlight here that Ayurveda says that Dhatu Samya Kriya Chod Okta Tantra Asya Prayojanam. That means it was the main to re establish the harmony and the equilibrium of all the dosha, dhatu, and mala, but not only that, sattvam, atma, shari, ratri, trayametam, tridandavat. So it was the harmony between my, mind, body, and soul. So it was physical, mental, and spiritual, which was very important. And the, uh, the care with compassion was the title of COVID Health Center at All India Institute of Ayurveda, which, which is a tertiary care hospital. And what we understood. Um, and what um, uh, what we can now uh, we are about to publish all the database with pre and post uh, report of each and every patient with inflammatory markers, immune markers, RT PCR, HRCT, 
and all the markers which everyone entire world wants like a d dimer and everything uh, so what we understood is the patient uh, died and the mortality and severe was only because of fear anxiety so it is the manas bhav which is very important because it was physically but socially also deprived isolated patient had hopelessness feeling so what we offered is a care with compassion and it was like uh, giving healing touch and that's what ayurved chikitsak does he understands listen to the patient so uh, as a chikitsak what is the difference between the ayurveda chikitsak as a true physician and the chikitsak from the conventional and the other one is that we give the healing touch because it is not it is not science of the treatment but it is a science of healing it is a science of it gives um, from illness it gives provides wellness but leads to the happiness so that care with compassion the healing touch counseling lifestyle counseling mental yes we are with you so that was the assurance what we could give them the patient and patient when they felt that familiar home away from home i think for them the assurance counseling was very important and along with that when we added yoga meditation and pranayam that is a spiritual bliss so that was sattva atma sharira so why i am telling all these things here on this ayurveda physician and the chikitsa because we have to understand the holistic nature of our chikitsa it is not only the physical medicine and only just giving one medicine versus one condition but it is the holistic nature and what is the time has arrived to understand everyone to translate our Uh, success stories uh, to each and every one so was so crore desh was not only that but each and every one across the globe because ayurved is a greatest gift uh, to the humanity from our own indian subcontinent and then we have to really have the approach of that's my message as with the experience of all india institute i am just trying to share that it is a holistic and integrated approach and integrated does not mean that the integration with the conventional medicine but the integration with biological modern biological tools of investigation we should have uh, radiology we should have uh, the biochemistry pathology immunology as our strength is so if we demonstrate uh, our outcomes even though with the holistic package of practices and we for each and every condition which is a strength of ayurveda what i would appeal we let us develop that pop package of practices uh, with the standard treatment protocol for each and every condition which is a strength of ayurveda but try to understand demonstrate with rog pariksha rogi pariksha our outcome measure of dhatu samya with all everything samadosh samadatu malakriya but similarly along on which side each and every case recording should be very very robust and try to demonstrate their success stories and outcome with the conventional measures so that i think if we lead want to lead uh, the medicine as a healthcare uh, as a healthcare provider and a leader in the 21st century the holistic and the integrated way uh, of har chikitsa is very very important and that i think the key, uh, that is the my message on this very important platform where uh, the visionary reader sri krishna kumar ji had envisioned uh, integrated transdisciplinary and interdisciplinary approach but what important is please stick to the principles of ayurveda our chikitsa sutra if we want to really treat diabetes prameha then sthula pramehi balavahani ka krushastate ka paridurpa so that is very important one of my very good teacher physician vaidya nanal ji he used to give halwa to krusha pramehi in the morning so people will were used to be astonished how the uh, sugar is being given but that's the sambruhanam tatra krushasya karyam so if we really stick to our own principle so rogam ado pariksha rog pariksha rogi pariksha avastha pariksha and then for each and every condition per person specific individual individualized chikitsa sutra within that framework is really understood i think that's the way of success at all india institute of ayurveda which is a tertiary care hospital we have 23 specialized unit and specialized units within the kai chikitsa we have diabetes musculoskeletal neurological we have 
इम्यूनो ऑटो इम्यून डिसऑर्डर्स रसायन वाचीकरण वी हैव मेंटल हेल्थ स्किन वी हैव रिसेंटली स्टार्टेड एंड नॉट ओनली दैट एज अ स्पेशलिटी अष्टांग आयुर्वेद वी हैव स्त्री रोग एज पीसीओएस एंड इनफर्टिलिटी एंड इन बाल रोग वी हैव सीपी सेरिब्रल पाल्सी सो वी हैव do we have to identify in each and every specialty what is the strength of ayurved why people are coming to us and if we develop a robust protocol and the facility and we decide what is feasibility where am i really interested into and if i just try to follow my dreams i love what i do and i really create the infrastructure as it is mentioned in the vaidya guna is a chikitsa prabhu so my infrastructures human resources chikitsa chatushpar like i should be empowered to the um, paramedical staff then the students paricharak and patient awareness i think that's the key of success and the entire world is looking us at us with the very very lots of hope that we create the evidence and hmis is very important hospital information management system in this new age technology digitalization case record patient capturing the history uh, then uh, giving the patient it is not only computer based digital but m ayurved that is a mobile based solution you really have to give the patient the entire patya apatya uh, that i think is the way uh, how we look at the patient but the tatva shastra and vyavahar principle should be ayurved based on the science classical but the vyavahar should be most relevant uh to the today's uh, need of the society because it uh, earlier it was understood that ayurved is only for non communicable diseases and chronic diseases but this covid has really proved and given the opportunity is that it is for communicable diseases and the very wonderful opportunity that we can demonstrate the result within 10 days i know the girija madam sir and i have seen many many presentation of all esteem panelists i was closely watching and observing we are also So silent observer of what is happening across India. It is not only one success story of all India, but there are many, many success stories. We are eager, and our younger generation and the students they are really eager. They want the confidence, not only confidence, but the competence. If we demonstrate that, we say confidently, yes, Ayurved can treat uh, within ten days. Positive becomes negative. Within ten days, we can uh, demonstrate on the immune markers and mean. recovery time comes um, reduces by 50% without any mortality without any severity so i think what what else we really want so this one story uh, as a standard treatment protocol which is evidence based practices and not only tertiary care but a specialized focus on a strength area i think that would boost the confidence of many youngsters across india and coming to the gp general practice in ayurved we have to find out uh, because 60 to 70% need of the people in the gp is really can be catered by ayurved for simple common cold um, fever like seasonal changes viral flu osteoarthritis musculoskeletal disorder we really have maybe we develop the package of practices it can be herbal mineral mineral single stand alone but maybe supported with diet yoga lifestyle try to under listen to the patient carefully minimize the time by giving the maximum principle line the practical way solution and uh, simple uh, we can have the opd based some panchakarmas opd based whatever is the ipd we can have the primary secondary to tertiary linkage as we have established most important thing i would like to again reiterate before i conclude is the strength of ayurved is not only in the treatment but strength of ayurved is in the prevention as well so we can be the leader of preventive medicine and as we have seen that in public health because many presentations i am eager to listen to them as well now uh, so ayurved in public health is the one greatest avenue and opportunity we could get in this covid pandemic and uh, ayurved uh, not only for the treat after patient becoming sick he should not come but not to not become sick that means as a prevention many many patients because we have the strength you can understand the market you can understand the opportunity huge if we understand and develop our expertise as a prevention because we have sava so crore deshwasi so if you see that capture each and every one and 10000 around our location and if you take care of their wellness 
and their well-being, holistic well-being, and create the awareness through online media, through social media. And if we really offer them good diet counseling, lifestyle counseling, prakruti specific counseling, simple rejuvenating herbs, rasayana herbs, and Tryopastamba, that is Ahara Nidra and Brahmacharya. How eight trees are 24, like Nidra, Ahara and lifestyle can really help in bringing the solution. And we have seen that only simple intervention of Kadha, right Kadha, not only only five medicines, but if we add Giloy, Amalki, Elaichi and others, that really have kept everyone safe, even amidst this Janapad And external environment, like creating harmony with our universe, environment, Havana, and many Daiva Vapashre, simple chikitsa, sattva avajay. So, with all these things holistic, preventive measures in public health, if we become the leader, I think that's what our Ayurveda would be the healthcare leader and uh, preventive medicine of the 21st century and coming century as well. Lastly, what all my youngsters, what I appeal, as we are also doing at All India Institute, even though it is a tertiary care center, we are we have the linkage with health and wellness centers, 500. We are very much, we are conducting uh, public health initiative research projects with Public Health Foundation with not only 80,000 Delhi police personnel, but we, have, we are conducting more than 11 PHI projects, public health initiatives supported with Ministry of Ayush, but with the scientific rigor so that our peoples of India will definitely get the confidence and our policy makers in the government will also like to in, in, like uh, integrate uh, with uh, Ayurvedic measures into national Ayush mission and national goal to minimize maternal mortality, children mortality and also mother and child care and antimicrobial resistance. So we have to work local but we have to have eye on the global initiatives and what is the uh, need which the global uh, community requires, WHO requires, what are the five major areas, what is the global uh, center for traditional medicine fortunately in India, but what we really look at. So our chikitsak, our practitioner has to play a very, very important role and not only to develop the confidence in our youngsters, students, but also the citizens of India. If they believe in Ayurveda, I think that can be the first choice of the patient uh, to choose Ayurveda, opt for the Ayurveda. And if at all it is required, then can be referred to the conventional medicine. So Ayurveda can be the mainstream medicine. That is our dream. And I'm sure on this platform, if we all dream together, that dream we can do better than anyone else can. And with the blessings of Honorable Krishna Kumar Ji, we will achieve this soon because he entire life he has dedicated for this cause and let us continue this cause. Thank you very much and my best wishes and compliments and congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for the insightful uh, and insights on uh, creating evidence and the robust practice and research, which is actually the necessity of this present scenario. Thank you so much for being with us, ma'am. We now move on to the sessions, uh, to the technical sessions. And uh, we have first Dr. PLT Girija with us, uh, who is a chief physician, Sanjeevani Ayurveda Chennai, who will be uh, talking on Ayurveda revitalizing public health in India. She's an Ayurvedic practitioner for nearly four decades, was teacher in Ayurveda colleges, has led projects under the government of Tamil Nadu, and has been uh, training around 2,500 village nurses and uh, on basically on maternal and child health care, which she is also practicing in WAST and uh, only basing, basically only using Ayurvedic practices. She's also authored a book, Jeevani Ayurveda for Women. Uh, ha happy to have you here, ma'am. And we should also highlight that she was robustly practicing on this COVID care. Uh, and uh, hers was the first paper that came on Ayurveda based on a case report. So very happy to have you here, ma'am. Over to you. Namaskar. There is a third point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Namaste to everybody. I'm, uh, am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma okay. 
thank you very much uh, for inviting me for this uh, memorial uh, lectures for uh, Krishna Kumar ji. Uh, Krishna Kumar ji was a person who had dedicated his entire life for the upliftment of Ayurveda and we will always remember him very fondly. Now, um, the topic for today is Ayurveda for revitalizing public health in India. It's an interesting topic and revitalizing is a very crucial word because we must recollect that uh, prior to the colonial occupation of India by the British, it was Ayurveda which was in the public health. In fact, uh, first millennium BCE itself, we had Sushruta and Charaka uh, had uh, well established. And uh, by fourth century, India had a very well established public health system. Uh, to give you an example, uh, the monk uh, pilgrimage on his pilgrimage, Fahian says about North Indian kingdoms had established in the cities houses for dispensing charity and medicine. All the poor and destitute in this country, orphans, widowers, and childless men, maimed people, cripples, and all who are diseased to go to these houses and are provided with every kind of help and the doctors examine their diseases. They get the food and the medicine which their cases require and are made to feel at ease and when they are better, they go away of themselves. So, then we have uh, several inscriptions right through. You would see 11th century Prasanna Venkateshwara Swami Temple in Tirubukodal and then uh, Arugya Shala uh, being mentioned in the 13th and 15th century in the uh, Sri Rangam Temple. All these inscriptions talk about uh, Vaidya Shalas, allotments and allocations and manyams being given to Vaidyas and endowments given to hospitals and Vaidya Shalas. So there has been a uh, very vibrant public health system in India. Now in the 18th century, many of you may already know this, there is a detailed account um, by Hallwell, Governor of Bengal in 1767 of the efficacy of practice called inoculation for smallpox. This was much before the vaccination was discovered by Jenner. And uh, about talking about this, he says, it is next to a miracle to hear that one in a million miscarries under it. So also you will see widespread healthcare system supported by society. For example, in the pre-British India, for example, there are 2,000 uh, revenue records of 2,000 localities near Chengalpet. And this speaks about that Chengalpet is near Chennai. And this also talks about maniums and uh, allocations. And 1% of the gross produce in these villages were allocated for healthcare. Now, in the 19th century, uh, you will see in Bengal about 485 villages. This is Williams Adams survey, which talks about this uh, report. There are 485 villages as about 2 lakh population. There is one medical college, two reputed physicians, 125 general practitioners, 205 village doctors, 21 smallpox inoculators, 297 midwives, 722 snake conjurers. Even today, we don't have this level of public health. Whichever may be the system, it's, it's, it, we don't have this. Now, the, um, there are many other reports which I cannot go on here, but one thing must be said, by the time British occupied India, like every other field, they put an end to all state support to uh, our medical system. And uh, Ayurveda was in a very, it reached a very dilapidated state with severe stress with no support coming from the state. Society, of course, continued to uh, benefit from it. And uh, so the post-independence Indian government followed the same British policy of uh, uh, making the Western medicine the primary health provider, even though in the British times, it was in a very rudimentary and primitive state 
compared to Ayurveda. And even after 75 years of independence, our health indicators are much worse than what it is in the rest of the world. Even in many of the Asian countries, the health indicators seem to be far better than India. Now, when we say health indicators, we mean life expectancy, which is still less than 70 in India, neonatal mortality, infant mortality, underpay mortality, maternal mortality, and these are largely the health indicators. And when we compare Europe, China, and many other Asian countries, India is in a far worse shape. Now, these are some of the statistics and um, maternal mortality and um, the reason for this. I think any any kind of a, just like disease, we should also diagnose what is wrong with our uh, public health today. And for that, we need to understand why is it not why is it showing such uh, poor health indicators? The, the major reason, one of the major reasons is that India spends very, very little on health care in general. And the second reason is India spends very little, it is totally neglects Indian systems of medicine. And the third reason is undue encouragement given to private sector to take the lead. These are the three primary reasons why we are in this bad state. Now, if you look at the um, the expenditure, for any any society to have a decent health care, you need to spend something like 5 to 6% of the GDP on health care, whereas India spends just 1%. Um, now, you look at what is India, China, Europe, USA, Africa, and the world. India spends the least GDP, just 1%. And uh, if you look at the government expenditure, on total expenditure, it spends very little on health. And if you look at the health expenditure on the total health expenditure, there also it is spending very little. Uh, and then if you look at, if you compare it with the rest of the world, you say you have all the Western European countries, then you have some Asian countries, then you have China, USA, Africa, Sri Lanka, India. Now, India spends only, the government spends only 30, whereas all other countries, even a capitalist country like America spends close to 50. And other countries, Western European countries spend far more. So what does it essentially mean that our people are spending most of their money on healthcare, whereas the government picks up very little? So a consequence of all this is our primary health is majorly neglected. And, uh, ref and the preference is given to specialist-led tertiary care hospitals and heavy out-of-pocket expenditure, which means that if a person spends 100 rupees on health care, only 30 rupees is, comes from the government and 70% of the expenditure is borne by the patient himself or herself. This situation has led to unnecessary medicalization, iatrogenesis and everything else that we see today. Now, if you look at the budgetary allocation, according to World Health Organization, 65% of the Indians are even now taking help from Ayurveda in very many ways. It could be uh, midwifery uh, help, it may be from bone setters, it may be a snake bite people, it could be village uh, vaidyas. That 65% of the population is in some way or the other, is still dependent on Ayurveda. And whereas if you look at our five-year plan, starting from the first five-year plan, uh, and then the first, uh, and then uh, the eleventh. Everywhere they talk about private sector being called into uh, health, uh, citing paucity of funds. And uh, then when they allocate the uh, for Indian systems of medicine, three percent is all what is allocated for Irish. Out of that, Ayurveda gets only one point one five percent. So you could see the poor state of affairs in the post-independence era. So this is the total outlay and, IS and Ayurveda gets much less. Now, now, I'll quickly go into how now if you introduce Ayurveda mainstream it and make it a public health system, then how better we could be. Now, diseases are innumerable. The newer and newer diseases keep appearing. Now, creating newer vaccines, tailor-made drugs with limited scope, 
for each new disease is not going to be a solution at all. Ayurveda has a strong theory. Ayurveda has an extensive pharmacopoeia and it has innumerable drugs and it is capable of dealing with a wide range of diseases. Now, the many advantages that Ayurveda has is it is first of all close to the idiom of the people and then it is present in, in every village in some form or the other and minor ailments can be treated at home. No complex machinery for diagnosis and cure is required. No sophisticated technology driven procedure is ever done in Ayurveda. And medicines can be procured locally. Medicines can be made locally. We are less dependent on pharma industry and they are safe and effective medicine. Despite having all these uh, uh, gunas, why is it that Ayurveda is still not uh, made a public health uh, system? That now let us see what are the areas. Now, public health challenges today, malnutrition is the major one. Infant mortality is a major public health issue today. Maternal mortality, anemia, communicable, non-communicable diseases, and mother and child care. Now, let's look how Ayurveda can handle malnutrition. Just to briefly tell you the something about India, 25% of all undernourished people live in India. One-third of world's chronically stunted children also live in India. 44% of Indian children are underweight. 75% of infants are anemic. Now, this is the state of affairs. And if we have to handle malnutrition, we cannot wait for 100 years. We need some short-term interventions that will overcome this problem. And today, if you look at what all malnourishment has led to, it has led to high mortality and morbidity. It has led to low birth weight. It causes nutritional anemia and low resistance to diseases in general and poor growth and development. Now, Sanjeevini, we had, uh, we had started an Ayurvedic intervention about six years ago. It was started when a group of people approached us saying that they have been trying to work in a Harijanwada in Andhra and they've been trying to give um, uh, a nutritional input by way they tried millets and they tried protein-rich food, they gave chickpeas. They tried this for two years and they don't see any difference. Then I told them what children need is basically an Ayurvedic input along with milk because after the milk, breast milk goes away, our children get no milk and milk is the most important thing for their growth and development. And you you, you put Ashwagandhadi churnam. Ashwagandhadi is reference from Sahasra Yogam. Ashwagandhadi churnam mixed with Loha Vasmam, you give it with milk and you will see the difference. Now, how it was administered was Ashwagandhadi churnam, 3 grams. Loha Vasmam, we give, uh, even though according to age, we just put in only 50 milligram. And lower basmam is discontinued after uh, six weeks. Then for six months, we give only milk and ashwagandhadi churnam. And then after six months, once again, we introduce lower basmam for six weeks. So in this manner, we uh, started this uh, program called Jeevani. And then uh, in within one month, we started seeing the results. And uh, nearby villages, some 11 village schools came forward and asked us to give it in there schools and so it went up to 11 villages and then we tried it in many places in Tamil Nadu and then uh, others like us who have our patients and friends they have done it in in Bangalore in Maharashtra in Andamans in uh, in uh, Jharkhand and many other states and the results are this is from uh, this is one of the Tamil Nadu uh, places and this is from Jart and now within one month the changes are noticed the very first thing that you start noticing is children stop falling sick their repeated visits to the doctors come to a halt they stop complaining about loss of appetite they complain of leg cramps leg pain cough cold fever then they they start noticing they're growing better their appetite improves the interesting thing the school teacher said was their attendance went up because they, are, they don't anymore fall sick and they are attending schools regularly. Now, when we did a survey in one place, it showed that they make something like two visits in a month to a doctor. 
and uh, they now found that on an average they're spending 500 rupees for these two visits including doctor's fee and medicines and when we found that when we calculated the cost of this milk and ashwagandha churnam it came to the same and so at at uh, at the same cost we are getting health and well-being of the children and uh, mal you can forget about malnourishment and anemia in children with this kind of intervention now we look at the uh, next problem namely the uh, rest, uh, infant deaths infant mortality the largest number of child death happens in india if you look at it globally and 50% of these deaths are due to respiratory problem and acute respiratory disorder and acute diarrheal diseases. Then another 20% of this is due to asphyxia at birth. Please note this 20% due to asphyxia at birth. I will talk about it later and tell you how we can entirely do away with this 20% and save lakhs of infants born. Now, we look at respiratory, acute respiratory infection. Normally, it is cold, cough, fever, breathing difficulty. More than 1 million children die of this acute respiratory infection. Among children, in fact, all over the world, there most children get acute respiratory disorders and the percentage is the same. Now, for all the children who go to a hospital, 50% are actually affected by ARI. And half the children who get nearly 40% of the children who are hospitalized is also because of ARI. Even though the incidence world over is the same, India has the highest mortality and morbidity. This is because our children are already malnourished, anemic, and they have poor resistance to diseases. Now, in Western medicine, what do they have to treat ARI? It must be said that more than 90% of the ARI are due to viral infection, and <clears throat> they have no proper treatment protocol for dealing with uh, virus. Now, modern Western medicine <coughs> universally gives something called cordemoxazole, an antibiotic. Even if it is a newborn, uh, even if it is a one-month-old child, if it has a respiratory problem, they administer cordemoxazole and it is not a drug which is safe, nor is it a dry, uh, drug which can boost your immunity, unlike Ayurvedic medicine. Uh, which is uh, whether it is bacterial or viral, it can take care of ARI very effectively. I need not list all, even Rajanyadi Churna will take care of all these uh, problems in infants. And uh, you know that Balasya Sarvarogeshu, it is such a fine medicine, which is what we use mostly till the child is almost two, three years old. We don't use anything else. Then you have innumerable uh, Churnams, which I need not list, or even Kashayams or uh, Irish thumbs and so and thumbs and so on and so forth. Now we come to acute diarrheal disease. Now, acute diarrheal disease, according to Western medicine, is caused by different organisms. Some of them are known, but mostly them are unknown. So they have no targeted remedial measures. And the only thing that they resort to is oral rehydration therapy, which is not a cure at all. Whereas in Ayurveda, it understands Atisara and variety of Atisara, Raktatisara and all types of Atisara. And we have specific medicines to deal with it. And I'm sure we can save many more children from ADD much better than any other system. Maternal mortality, again, is a major issue. And uh, there are various reasons. Obstetric causes are some of them. Anemia is responsible for 40% of maternal deaths in India. Anemia, of course, is a national disease and it's a national calamity. It's the most debilitating disease among women, pregnant women and children. And more than half of Indian women, three-fourths of Indian children, and they're all anemic. And uh, it increases the risk of death and disease. And as I said earlier, in some form, in some way or the other, 40% of maternal deaths are associated with anemia among women. Now, National Nutritional Anemia Prophylactic Program, which was started in the fourth five-year plan, it is now 60, 70 years old. And even now, this is the state of anemia in this country. You can imagine how effective the cyanine and folic acid is. Whereas, we can have a number of medication for uh, iron compounds, aristams, surinams, medicated ghee or whatever, which can take care of our 
uh, women and children in a far better manner. Um, now we come to pregnancy and delivery care. Now, pregnancy care, if you ask an uh, obstetrician, uh, she will tell you, eat, eat well, eat everything. Pregnancy is not a disease. They have nothing at all to suggest what a pregnant woman should eat. There is no masanamasam. They have no way of telling you what is the kind of uh, um, preparation you need to ensure a safe delivery. And then we have uh, uh, eighth month Niruvasti, ninth month Snehavasti. We have uh, um, Pichu, which will save us from this cruel episiotomy business. And uh, then there is uh, excellent uh, post-delivery care. So as far as pregnancy and delivery is concerned, there is... Uh, there is nothing much to talk about in modern system. And also, if you look at the institutional care, the more we have institutionalized uh, the deliveries, the more has been the cesarean deliveries. This has been uh, concomitant that you will find that uh, urban is more than rural because rural, most of the deliveries even in India, even about 55% is still delivered by uh, the eyes. So, and also private sector and public sector, if you look at it, it's a lot of um, cesarean deliveries which is taking place and mortality from C-section is 10 to 20 times higher in normal delivery than vaginal delivery. And not only that, unnecessary C-sections always divert resources. Otherwise, these resources could have been used uh, very effectively to cover necessary services in our public health. And uh, so these are some of the things about uh, institutional deliveries. Now, if you look at, see, one of them is urban and rural. It's 65 percent urban in some place, which was at Lakshadweep. Huh? There are many other. Uh, Telangana is very, very high. Now, if you look at the public and private sector, some of them are close to 80 percent. In the private sector, deliveries are cesare C-sections. And private uh, public uh, institutions are no less Look at Kerala is uh, 31.4, which is very high. Telangana is, even government hospitals are doing 40. Whereas in the private sector, it is 75%. Now, these are some of the problems with our system. Now, the only way we can ensure that our majority of our women go through a natural delivery is to uh, ensure that our diets are mainstream. They have tremendous obstetric skills. Their sole objective is to ensure a, a natural delivery. And earlier I said about this 20% asphyxia can be done away with. Now, what is meant by that? What is asphyxia at birth? Asphyxia is that child does not cry. Now, child does not cry and breathe at deli after delivery. It means two minutes would mean, according to them, um, uh, impairment, serious impairment and abnormalities, and five minutes would mean death. Now, if you look at the dice, they deliver the child along with the placenta, and as long as the child is attached to placenta, the child does not die. Uh, and one-fifth of uh, all, the, all the infant deaths that occur due to asphyxia, which is the 20% I was talking about, could have been avoided had the uh, obstetricians have been taught to deliver with placenta. Now, placenta delivery, I uh, I witnessed one of them. And uh, this is the one uh, where it took uh, quite some time, about 40, 50 minutes for the child to be fully uh, alive and um, the cord could be cut. And in the meantime, uh, the, the placenta is immersed in uh, water and constantly the child's face is splashed with water. And we keep pumping the placenta till the child revives. Now, this doesn't cost the exchequer ex even one naya paisa more just to deliver with placenta that even that they don't do. And this is done by all our dyes all across India. Our dyes are midwives. Now... Uh, RCH program in Tamil Nadu in 2003, we had a drug kit containing Ayurveda and Siddha medicines. And I must say the demand for it was much more than the supply, especially post-delivery, Saubhagya Shunti, the oils and so on. Now we come to communicable diseases. As uh, Madam spoke to me, spoke earlier, um, 
the COVID-19 has been an eye-opener to most people. And uh, standalone Ayurveda of COVID-19 was treated all over India by Ayurveda Vaidyas and Siddha Vaidyas very effectively. And the mortality and morbidity do, uh, when treated with Ayurveda was a minuscule compared to what is happening in the mainstream medicine. And the same thing was, and standalone Ayurveda, it's not as though that uh, they were uh, um, treating it with other um, unnecessary drugs. And uh, similar things were witnessed when uh, there was chikungunya epidemic in 2006, dengue, swine flu, all these according to modern Western medicine is caused by viruses and no specific treatment exists. And they unnecessarily, uh, the only medicine that is prescribed is antipyretic painkillers, antibiotic steroids, anti-malarial drugs and zinc and vitamin C and a whole range of and blood thinners, none of which is uh, a focused treatment for any of them. So um, Ayurveda uh, and Indian systems of medicine can treat a large number of these communicable diseases very, very effectively if uh, it is mainstream into public health system. Now we come to chronic ailments. We, I need not explain about chronic ailments because a lot of them come all the time to Ayurveda. There could be diabetes, there could be um, arthritis or the diseases of uh, bones and muscles and joints and digestive disorders and uh, even cancer. I know of many Vaidyas treating very successfully. I have heard of heart disease being successfully treated by many Ayurveda Vaidyas. So, um, there are, um, Ayurveda has excellent treatment, understanding and uh, medication to treat any chronic ailments. And we have especially something called Panchakarma, which is very valuable and which is very unique to uh, Ayurveda. So, uh, and uh, last, namely the surgery. Surgery is one of the eight limbs of Ayurveda. And we have a number of surgical procedures. Bone setting is a classic example because bone setting is very widespread. Today, even a simple fracture, uh, they now people have orthopedic have forgotten how to set it. So they have to do a surgical procedure on that. So whereas our bone setters very effectively, I have seen, I have heard of uh, one of the orthopedic, uh, senior orthopedic surgeon from Madras uh, Medical College saying that he has seen even compound fractures being set uh, very well by bone setters. Shara Sutra, uh, an anorectal condition uh, where Shara Sutra is used is also very effective. Now, one major problem with uh, Western medicine in uh, surgery is they find it very difficult to heal wounds. Wound healing is a major problem and they keep having so many conferences just on wound healing. Whereas in Ayurveda Siddha system, there are very effective medicines for wound healing. Uh, in fact, one of the veterinarian in uh, uh, head of a veterinary uh, uh, hospital who contacted us wanting to uh, treat with Ayurvedic medicines because he was finding that antibiotics were taking a very long time for the wounds to heal. And so he started using antiseptic solution. Uh, instead of antiseptic solution, he was using trifala water and he was using uh, for wound uh, healing um, a combination given by us, which is kungilium. Kungilium is sarjarasam. Then Padiga Basmam, Padiga Linga Sendoram, which these two are uh, Siddha preparation from Spatikam. And these uh, heal the wounds in one month's time, whereas antibiotics took three months. And uh, there was a lot of pus and blood oozing, and whereas this, uh, this powders healed it in a very clean manner. And sometimes he said even the, even the scar tissue had disappeared with them. They, I had a lot of pictures of it they provided. Uh, by this uh, Madras Race Club. So now we are talking about public health. Um, you can see that unless and until there is a major uh, um, uh, budget provision for Indian systems of medicine, currently it is 1.15 for Ayurveda and totally 3%. This is less than what they allocate for All India Institute of Medical and AIMS in Delhi. And uh, unless we increase it substantially from 3% to at least 30%, I don't see how Ayurveda can provide the kind of infra infrastructure that can uh, uh, help the public health system. Then we should have uh, hospitals at uh, district level, PHC and Ayurvedic departments with good qualified Ayurveda doctors. And uh, many of these uh, 
Also, institutional initiatives should be there. We should have uh, well-equipped Ayurvedic colleges, hospitals, and in every district and uh, major taluks. And we should have all the Ashtangas of Ayurveda in it. And uh, we should definitely teach them pure Ayurveda. This is one thing which is lacking, which in every talk I have repeatedly mentioned, that Ayurveda cannot be corrupted with all kinds of inputs. Uh, Ayurveda should be pure that the doctors uh, who pass out of the Ayurvedic system are competent enough to diagnose and treat with pure Ayurveda. And pure Ayurveda does not mean we cannot collaborate. We can collaborate, but we have to be good in our own science uh, in, a, in a proper way. And uh, we should also uh, have uh, uh, better educational facilities uh, made and like AIMS, we should also have several uh, uh, Ayurvedic institutes everywhere. And also in terms of um, drugs manufacturing, we should have National uh, Ayurveda Pharmaceutical Corporation, which will undertake manufacturing and distribute authentic Ayurvedic medicines. And availability of these rare drugs also should be made uh, um, more extensively available. And we should have a more rational export policy uh, where we are not exporting away all our scarce resources for uh, for uh, one cheap uh, money that we may get as uh, return. So I think there is a lot of thinking has to go into uh, Ayurveda and uh, where, how it can be uh, helped to revitalize public health in India. I think with this, I would like to finish my uh, presentation and thank you very much. Thank you, Madam. Thank you so much for putting forth the historical preview, the challenges faced in the public health and also the intervention possibilities. Thank you so much. But before we move on to the next session, there's a quick question. Uh, it's to repeat the formulation of uh, Ashwagandha. Can you please? It is there in uh, Sahasra Yoga. It is similar to Thali Saji uh, It is one part Lavangam, two part Nagakesaram, four parts Ela, eight parts Maricha, 16 parts Vipali, 32 parts Shunti, 64 parts Ashogandha, and 128 parts Shakara. This okay. is there in Sahasra Yoga. Okay. And if you look at the Falasruti, it is a very good Falasruti. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much for joining us with the discussion, ma'am. And now, we'll now move forward for the next session, which is by Dr. J. K. T. J. Krishnan. Uh, he'll be uh, speaking on clinical Ayurveda in a contemporary world, adapting Ayurveda principles and adopting modern technologies for practice. He's a chief medical officer, Ayurveda Pharmacy Company Limited at Chennai, and uh, he's presently at Ashanta Ayurveda Hospital. His experience in the field of Ayurveda is unmatched. He has been closely associated with AVP for nearly four decades and is an eminent teacher and was part of Ayurveda College Coimbatore and uh, Jayendra Saraswati College Chennai. He is a consummate clinician and an educator and he uh, is well versed in Tarka and experimental uh, training on clinical practice. Uh, we have a recording of JK sir and uh, we'll be, uh, he'll be joining us at the panel. I feel honored to talk about Okay. Okay. Association of 
involving most of the top teachers of Ayurveda was initiated by Krishna Kumarji. I think it was done in 1992. Nearly 300 teachers, all the top teachers of India in the field of Ayurveda participated to give their high-level opinion about how to improvise the teaching of Ayurveda so that the students get convinced about uh, what is being taught. Those problems are still there in the field of Ayurveda. Many places we just try to follow up the syllabus, complete the syllabus, whether that is convincing, whether that is translated into a practical level, that is a different issue because of too much of a departmentalization, many other reasons, Ayurveda is not totally conveyed to the student community. And Krishna Maharaj was totally concerned with that, how to make it convincing, how to create, how to make somebody a fully confident Ayurveda physician so that he can deal with any disease then and there, not just to follow what is told in the text. Any situations can be dealt with confidently with the backing of the theory of Ayurveda. She was very convinced about what is the requirement. Uh, you need a 100% clarity in knowing what is Ayurveda. Of course, with the support of uh, parallel shastras like yoga, sankhya, uh, jyotisha, whatever is well connected, including Vedanta. Wherever such help is needed, those things need to be introduced so that uh, anybody can become a confident individual in dealing with Ayurveda. That is one aspect of it. Uh, to some extent, we were all able to uh, do this kind of, uh, achieve this kind of growth in convincing very intellectual students about uh, Ayurveda. But in addition to that, Krishna Maharaj also wanted to see that Ayurveda is known to a lot of people, a lot of uh, products, especially from Pambitu, Whoever came in close contact with Krishna Kumarji, they all became confident physicians. And this knowledge of Ayurveda needs to be translated and communicated effectively to the contemporary physicians of modern science. That was his uh, second requirement. So that people at large throughout the world get uh, totally benefited out of this knowledge of Ayurveda. So the second area was uh, more difficult. Because those ideas in the mind only started a lot of uh, research activities, came in contact with a lot of uh, modern doctors, invited to Kaimatu, and a lot of activities were initiated in the research area that was also effectively conducted. So two areas uh, were very clearly outlined by Krishna Kumarji. One is just uh, getting a clear picture of what is Ayurveda so that anybody can deal with any disease according to the situations then and then not just by hurting it, not just by copying it, whatever is going on somewhere. Independently, trying to understand the disease situation and according to the understanding of the disease, medicines or programs are uh, selected and induced to see that the result is knowledgeably created by the doctors. 
Second thing is that in addition to this primarily uh, important understanding, overall understanding of the disease, body, and whatever is uh, programs followed in the present area in the modern science, with the basic knowledge of that, that means anatomy, physiology, pathology, pathophysiology. Whatever changes are happening in the body when we are pursuing an Ayurvedic program, that also needs to be documented and properly conveyed to the contemporary scientist who is interested in that. These two areas are the uh, prime important concerns Krishna Kumaraj always used to put forth and many years they were able to take it. So today's uh, topic also is uh, connected to reflect this understanding of Krishna Kumaraj. All these things are in addition to his personality, versatile personality which uh, encompass different areas. Many of them are not exposed, many of them are totally exposed. Some people would have been very lucky to be very close to him to understand him from a different way. I am concerned with the areas connected to Ayurveda. This is what I am trying to explain today. So, uh, if the uh, the uh, help of a disease, understanding of a disease, I would like to explain how we can approach it from a classical Ayurvedic point and how that can be translated in a modern understanding so that anybody can get a better picture of it, whether they belong to a modern scientific community or an Ayurvedic community. We know that Ayurvedic people are also nowadays exposed to this modern understanding very well. They don't have any problem understanding this kind of uh, modern terms and all. So, as far as uh, Ayurvedic people are concerned, I think uh, very most commonly dealt disease is Mother uh, Vyadi, especially back pain, low back pain. Few reasons are there. Low back pain is not very well dealt with uh, other signs other than the surgical intervention. But rather it is better dealt with in Ayurveda. There is a better result in Ayurveda. But most of us, most of us are familiar with dealing with the back pain. And it is a other reality where we all know how when you say what is Vada Vyadi, a straight tender in the deeper plane of Ayurveda, expecting that majority of the listeners would be easily understand. We know the body as a, what a gross plane of a, a earth and water, which is a gross structure. Subtle structure includes uh, the agony, which is responsible for a, uh, segregating the nourishment to different parts so that in the subtle level, movement of energy, movement, transportation, transformation, growth, all those things are movements happening in the space. Movement is considered to be Pada, space is considered to be Agasha. So there is a big difference between understanding of modern science and Ayurveda. 
modern science gives a lot of importance to Guru's plan of Prithvi and Jela. The other anatomy is more confined to that area. When we talk about body, we give a lot of importance to how far the movement is smoothly happening in the subtle plane of body. That much we assume that the gross plane is health. The strain stress is given to the subtle plane. Whether the movement is properly happening or not, this is the primary concern. Whenever the movement is disturbed, there is still we talk about uh, an increasing level of vaga. If that is not properly addressed, it can visibly show some damage to the structure, growth structure, so that the vaga movement is more and more disturbed to be known as vaga. So this is a gross difference. So nowadays we know that when you get a back pain, we have a lot of options to understand what has happened to the uh, lumbar particular column. It may be confined to the lumbar vertebra or the disc, which is placed in between the vertebral bodies. Or it may be the weakness in the losses you talk about. It is a result of the uh, strain to the bone as a result of lack of supply of nourishment to the bone, maybe lack of draining from the side of this bone, or even lack of draining of even lymphatic fluid. So the entire structure is confined to that area. It can be bone, it can be disc, it can be the nerve ending, it can be the muscle, it, it can be the ligaments on which the bones are being hanged. If you are just closely looking at that place where there is a resultant damage. In addition to that, whatever areas are connected to that lower back, for example, we know the muscles like uh, trapezius or vertebral ligaments, which are connected to different parts, like even neck and now. Or in this time, which is totally connected to the peritoneum into the lower back abdominal wall, is connected to the entire muscles of the back. We know that the most important Vada Sthana is a quashing, large intestine, which is attached to the peritoneal connection to the abdominal wall, especially in the back. So, according to Ayurveda, we know the back uh, of quashing of Vada and Visheshada. If there is a Vada atmosphere, there is a Rutra nature beyond your requirement in Pakwasya, that Jutranathus can be gradually transferred into different parts, wherever you are straining too much, that area can be easily affected. So Jutra nature, dried nature, into the lower back can be easily resulted even from the dark in this time. This is some of our concerns to address the back pain from different angles. In addition to whatever we are doing from the uh, local areas, go back, just like we see Kadivasti. So when we know that uh, through the modern investigations, MRI, MRI, X-rays, other physical investigations, whatever has gone with this physical structure, whatever is the possibility of dealing with that, that is done with the help of a 
सिंपल विषय में मूर्त पाई थी Beyond that, there is a lot of scope for Ayurvedic people. Where, if you are concerned with uh, exactly trying to understand how this situation has emerged for this particular individual, this is only concern for a typical Ayurvedic physician. This particular individual has got back pain. How did it happen to this individual? This is what is known as some problem. So you must have a deeper understanding of what is happening in this individual, so that there is a weakness in the low back as a result of many other changes happening. Maybe confined to the local area, maybe confined to different. Other structures being involved, or maybe confined to many other diseases, confined to the costa, especially there could be no gregarian access, abyssalia kind of diseases, which can continuously create a vada dormant atmosphere in the costa. It can contribute to the other nature in any part of the body. So, such a deeper analysis of the individual to understand what is the excite pathogenesis, some trouble, and to reverse that pathogenesis, some part of the vegetarian is the treatment. So, whatever. Understanding you are getting about the manifestation of the disease. Accordingly, we will be selecting a medicine. We will be going for a treatment. Your selection of medicine, your selection of treatment program, are directly proportionate to your understanding of how the disease is managed. Nothing is to be lighthearted. It's the knowledge you are creating. It's the work you are doing in the intellectual plane. Where the samhita textbooks, or your experience, or your talks with the senior doctor, or your practice with the your own practice, or your practice with other doctors. All those things will be creating an understanding, creating a knowledge in the background. Based on that knowledge, you are creating an understanding then and there. It's nothing to be by heart. Each individual needs to be understood from the uh, as a new case, new disease. Forget about all other things. Try to understand how this individual has got the disease. Eda dushte na dushte na, eda anvisarpita. This is what we are trying to understand. How this has happened to this particular individual? Based on that understanding, what is to be done? This is what we do. So we need to understand the body from the perspective of. Ayurveda as well, like Kosta, Saga, Atimarman, Adhus. Understand that this is based on this anatomy. In addition to the knowledge of anatomy, emphasis. The advantage is that whatever you are doing in such diseases, for example. When we say that we are just doing the cardiology, which is, to my understanding, is very passionate. We are doing a lot of uh, educated calling. We are affected every day of the day, maybe five days, seven days, and back pain is really. But your understanding can be well explained in 
regarding the selective medicine or dealing with the diseases through the treatment programs, and knowledgeable, knowingly relating into research, cure making a cure in a particular industry. So it can increase the it is the knowledge which is working according to the standard. So when the knowledge becomes total, complete, this can be easily conveyed to the other people of contemporary time according to their finger. It is just a position, you can just explain this in a this way. It is somebody who is trying to learn this Ayurveda. Now, where is it? Coming and learning Ayurveda. And somebody who is doing the first time is for the other area. According to the requirement of contemporary people, we will be able to explain Ayurveda from the different level. To their satisfaction. It becomes possible provided you have a clarity of knowledge in your own self. What is known as a what is saying? Shastra should be very clear without any doubt to create your own knowledge. So that it can be conveyed to the people who require it from the different level. So, Maja always used to say that everything depends upon the effort of the individual to transform in the himself. Every effort you are making in your life is an uh, effort transforming the person. So that you understand yourself completely. On that plane only, we try to understand different things. So, based on the individual's requirements, some people may require a few percent noise, some people may require 78 percent, some people may require 100 percent knowledge. You must be a trip to be 100 percent knowledge so that. You can supply, you can help, you can satisfy people who are coming to you with the actual, which is the uh, with the electricity connected to know what exactly I So to that extent, we must be equipped, especially if you are having a background of modern knowledge nowadays. I should make it quite a number of the total clarity of the Ayurveda as the Shastra. As the Shastra, I should be, I should be contributing a lot in fulfilling the, uh, what is the required in this end of the case of Bhai. The Krishna is going to be the best thing I can contribute. For your understanding, your life, your practice, your knowledge of power, total understanding of life, through that understanding, we will be contributing in life. We will be paying very big tribute to the uh, understanding of the late Krishna Kumarthi in supporting, in propagating, in making it possible, in Achieving the total purpose of Ayurveda as in the same time, a Krishna Kumar. It is still good as in the same time. And thank everybody for having me given an opportunity to talk in this occasion as a tribal to the late Krishna Kumar. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello? Hello? People know? I will keep it in there. Yes, sir, you know what it is. Thank you.
Thank you, sir. That was an elaborate description. And uh, thank you so much for uh, being with us and through the video, for sending it to us. Uh, we now move on to the next session. It's on medical pluralism. So as we all know that uh, through the COVID season, we have seen how important it is to understand medical pluralism and how prepared Ayurveda is. That's the topic for now. And Dr. Unnikrishnan Payapali, sir, will be elaborating on it. He's a visiting professor, Center for Local Health Tradition and Policy, an Ayurveda physician and a development researcher since uh, 2010, he has been working with the UNO, uh, UN uh, University, Tokyo, Japan, in various capacities in health systems and sustainability related programs. His uh, research interests are Ayushan in health systems, public health, traditional knowledge, episte epistemology, and sustainable development. So, over to you here. Over to you, sir. We'll more hear more about medical pluralism. Thank you. I'll share my slide. Is it, can you, can you see it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please go ahead. So the slides are also visible? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. So, um, first of all, um, I would like to Mm, offer my humble pranams um, to Krishna Kumarji's memories. Um, I think this is a very emotional movement moment because uh, all of us developed through as young children to Krishna Kumarji's care and mentoring. So it's really um, uh, a very touching moment for me to participate in this. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, Dr. Devidas Varia, Dr. Indulal, uh, Jagrishman sir, and all the respected dignitaries, Dr. Tanaja, NSRI Madam, uh, Dr. PLT Girja, my fellow panelist, uh, Dr. Vinayak Patikal, and uh, uh, Dr. Vijay Nangil sir, and uh, many other respected dig dignitaries in this meeting. Uh, Dr. Prasad is there. So um, I will be speaking about medical pluralism. I will be brief uh, because I, I thought there may be some time for the um, question answer session. So I'm just examining how we, how prepared are we in this context uh, in comprehensive primary health care and public health. Uh, Dr. Girija have, uh, has beautifully elaborated uh, what is the significance of Ayurveda in uh, public health and comprehensive primary health care, so which makes my um, talk much easier. So uh, let me start with uh, my own experience at Patanjali Guri, which was a visionary project of Krishna Kumarji and Jay Krishnan sir beautifully elaborated the Gurukula system, uh, which was there and how nine batches of us um, benefited out of it. I reached Patanjali Puri, Mankare, which is a small village near Anekati, and most of you know that. And um, uh, I reached there as a young 15-year-old boy, um, um, as a young student after my 10th class. And uh, uh, it was uh, uh, in 1984, this was a remote village uh, with, uh, with hardly any access to transport. And nearby villages were mostly tribal, uh, which was consisting of uh, uh, the uh, mix of Kannada, Tamil, and uh, Malayali uh, tribes in this, in this region. What I vividly remember is that Krishna Kumarji had uh, started two very interesting projects that time uh, in this college. And it was uh, seven and a half years of Gurukula education. We had to go through the Priya Veda. But right from the beginning, I think, uh, I'm just now uh, reflecting on this visionary project, uh, this project in Padajaliburi. And what I realized is that the, the primary health center that he established in Mangari, uh, which was uh, or, I mean, um, mostly intended for the tribal communities in that region, and the village visits that he arranged for every student 
uh, in the nearby villages in Veerapandi or Dumeno or Anekati and so on. I think these were really kind of opening uh, the doors of public health and primary health care to all of us. And uh, I can talk a lot about this, but what I would like to really point out is uh, about Krishnabhaji's foresight into Ayurveda's um, uh, world of public health and comprehensive primary health care then. If you uh, recollect, the pro this college was initiated in 1978, and it was the time when Almata Declaration was being discussed by WHO member states and uh, comprehensive primary health care. That time, it was Health for All by 2080, was being discussed thoroughly among the member states, drawing spirit from various country examples. And I think uh, Krishnamurti has a clear uh, vision of this development uh, where Ayurveda should be contributing to in rural communities um, exactly at that time. And this is why he started the WHO project for as a primary health center, which offered an integrative service, including mother and child health services and so on, in that small village of Mantra. And he also ensured that all uh, students and all colleagues, we, we were around 100 of us, we visited nearby village, we got exposed to the social life. Because WHO uh, Health for All was also talking about multi-sectoralism, participatory and people-centered health and health system development and so on. Uh, it has been almost 45 years since then now. The second thing is that immediately after this, uh, starting of this call, is the Ramalinga Swami report, which came about in 1981. And subsequently, the first national health policy in which uh, a community health workers program was mentioned, the first Indian national health policy after uh, several years of independence came about in 1983. So you can see how his uh, thinking was locally aligned but he had this global foresight of what was happening in, uh, in WHO. And when he started Ancient Science of Life, I, I was just remembering Dr. Ramanoha's post recently. He got um, comments from WHO regional office and the head office in Geneva to endorse Ancient Science of Life as a uh, scientific journal. So this was his foresight. And uh, I don't know, uh, this is why I say that this is really a touch touching moment. Let me now move on without further delay uh, to what uh, is the topic today about medical pluralism. So there are, I'll be quick because uh, we can move on to the panel next. So if you look at the pluralism, there are two broad perspectives of pluralism. Pluralism is, um, uh, one is a long prevailing phenomenon in health system that multiple systems of medicines coexist in the health system. But pluralism is also understood as something co-opted by the state, by the government. So these are the two broad works. But the early works on medical pluralism talks much about the sociocultural aspects of this popular culture. So it's not the co-opted co language of the state or the government that the early works of uh, Professor Charles Leslie and so on talk about. Why I'm saying all of this is this is very significant to the later uh, slides that I will be showing. So uh, the initial studies on medical pluralism was based on um, a health system policy perspective by contrasting it with biomedicine or allopathy. So you can see the dichotomy between uh, allopathy and traditional medicine in the early studies itself. Then one strong view by uh, Western scholars is that uh, Indian medical system is poor and there's hardly any medical care, inadequate health infrastructure, lack of access, all of this and quality of care, all of this has led to multiple systems still surviving in this period uh, as traditional medicine. And they call it as forced pluralism. So when modern care is not there, all of this continue to exist. That's what they say. And especially there are scholars from uh, the US who, uh, some of them who strongly talk about this. Then, so there's also a view that pluralism is a product of multiple notions of efficacy, cure, and care among the population emerging from the cultural ignorance. That's also a very kind of Western ethnocentric view of how, why Ayush exists in India still today. But these are all works in 80s and 90s. Things have changed a lot. 
Now there is an Indian school of thought which talks about medical pluralism and Sujata and Lena and all that. They talk about limitation of clinical aspects of allopathy and uh, Dr. Girija beautifully uh, picturized uh, in various ways. Uh, and in outcomes of diseases that elude medical systems, that is what is leading to pluralism. There is a long historical path, a long prevailing phenomenon in the society as a lived experience. So we, we and the people have overlapping instrumentalities. The people are able to handle multiple systems of knowledge and seeking care in, same, uh, in, in the needs of care. So the long historical path, which has led to constant popular culture of integration, this is a strong idea from Indian uh, understanding of medical pluralism. They further say that public swiftly integrates between various systems. Uh, but I will come to that later. Then there are these ideal uh, uh, these, uh, perspectives on nationalistic ideologies, how we, India wanted to revive and how we, India wanted to keep Ayurveda in its thing, and how it has become now a counter current to modernity. So these are all sociological and anthropological perspectives. But if you look at the policy related uh, discussions on this. Um, uh, Dr. Ratupriya and so on, who are experts in community medicine and social health, they talk about India's policy approaches to pluralism uh, with significant asymmetry. Because when Dr. Girija was talking about, she highlighted the need for uh, up, my, my supporting bone setters, dyes, and so on. So, but that's not happening because in 2002 only, in the second national health policy, LHT was even mentioned as a uh, local health traditions was mentioned. So uh, Ritu Priya says there is a significant asymmetry in and hierarchy, and it is kind, kind of undemocratic pluralism. So if you look at the post-independent policies around 1945 to 1950s, the Bure Committee, which talked about in 1948 when they talked about, it was a completely Western-centered development model that they suggested. Then the Chopra Committee, which parallelly made the report, talked about a revivalist model for um, uh, Ayush or Indian systems of medicine. At the same time, there was another view, Soke Committee, who talked about people-centered pluralistic approach. So you can see there also this kind of policy uh, differences in different committees that worked out. And until Ramalinga Swami committee, you can see this um, uh, kind of arguments and counter arguments and so on. Why am I um, talking about it? This will be clear later uh, if we reflect on what's our position today as Ayush. Then uh, Helen Lambert and so on, who have worked a lot with uh, Rajasthani bone setters, they say in 2017, she says there is a selective systematization of uh, knowledge extrusion. And this is about like Satwa uh, Chikitsa, Daivogya Pastra Chikitsa. All this is selectively, uh, I mean, excluded. And what we see as Ayush today is a kind of, uh, kind of, uh, mm, a limited perspective of the potential of Ayush. So what she says is an intracultural discourse about medical pluralism expressive of a, an exclusive vision of Indian modernity. This is what uh, I cannot go into the details, but I just wanted to highlight this. And so, and uh, recently, Darshan Shankarji and uh, Dr. Bhushan Patakarthan wrote in response to the high-level expert committee on universal health coverage. They talked. Uh, they talked uh, about how I should be promoted. What they said is there is fragmentation in the current health policy planning, creating silos of different medical systems. The idea of pluralism suggests the need to develop common strategic focused health research agenda aligned to emerging national needs. And this is a very key word. Considerable investment is required for integrative clinical research, education and practice. This is what Darshan and Bhushan uh, came to talk about recently. So if you look at the developments, now uh, from 1978, I talked about the Almata then the WHO policies on uh, 2002 to 2005 uh, traditional medicine strategy. The subsequent two periods, it was the WHO position on medicine. But from 2014 to 2023, now we have the new strategy, which talks different languages of people-centered, integrative, participatory health system in which 
um, traditional medicine have ro roles. Now, in Indian context, I already talked about the Ramalinga Swami Committee report in 1981, which drew spirit from Almata, then the National Health Policy in 1983. The 2002, very significant because the resource allocation suddenly improved when uh, Mrs. Shailaja Chandra was the health secretary. The, the next two planning periods gave a lot of importance to Irish systems. And most comprehensive in 2017, we had the National Health Policy, which had pluralism as the key component of Indian health system. Now, from Almata, if you look at from comprehensive primary health care, we went into selective, selective primary health care, which talked about um, selective services like growth monitoring and so on, um, uh, oral rehydration, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Then now we are back to comprehensive primary health care. This is reflected also in Ayushman Bharat, and uh, which Ayushman Bharat talks about an expanded range of comprehensive primary health care services through the health and wellness centers. And financial protection, which is a key that uh, Dr. Girija talked about how many people are being indebted uh, through private health seeking, around 70%, which is very high in India. So how Ayushman Bharat is trying to establish and reclaim good health and financial protection, equity and all. This is the most comprehensive policy in 2007. And we know that last two decades, Ayush uh, has developed in a major way. Now we have the Ministry of Ayush and we see, saw how Ministry of Ayush has been very proactively responding to the uh, the calls of COVID-19, etc. Now the uh, present national policy planning process is visualizing an integrative health system by 2030, which is in line with the UG, UHC, Universal Health Coverage, uh, 2030, the SDG goals, the Sustainable Development Goals of 2030, etc., etc., for a strong evidence-based integration of higher systems. So now Niti Aayog is discussing this for comprehensive primary health. Now let me, with that, let me move on to the next aspect of my presentation. We are talking about this, these services in Irish health and wellness centers and the health and wellness centers, which are of one lakh fifty-five thousand all over India. And Irish wellness centers will be around twelve thousand five hundred, and an extension of these services. So you can see from pregnancy and child health, uh, infant health care services like ARIs and uh, acute diarrhea, adenovirus, and all that including palliative care, elderly care, all this is covered through this comprehensive health care plan. Now, what are the challenges in comprehensive primary health care and public health for Ayush? So right from the beginning, if you look at, we, uh, there is a parallel approach for Ayush integration in the post-independence period. And I think this has been a major hindrance for us to confidently talk in health systems today. Strategy in the national programs, if you look at from 2005, we had the National Rural Health Mission and there was uh, co-located centers. There were many experiments by the Ministry of Ayush. I mean, then it was the Department of ISM uh, and so on. And we had the National Health Mission. Now we have the National Ayush Mission, NAM program, and the health and wellness centers. That's what we have reached in public health arena. So due to this parallel kind of development, we, it is leading to a lack of inter-system understanding and appreciation. You can see that when a bridge course was uh, uh, proposed, immediately there was a lot of hue and cry about it. So uh, uh, we are not able to confidently create that kind of an evidence-based institutional approach for uh, and primary healthcare outcomes as a key goal, not integration of Ayush alone. We need good health outcomes. So what is the role of Ayush in universal health coverage? Universal health coverage is what is about how many, what population is covered, what services are covered, and what is the financial risk protection. And India has, I think these are very critical for India today. So what is Ayur, Ayurveda's health system role today? There is a clear lack of role definition of a Vaidya in Indian health system. I'm not blaming any ministry or anybody for this, but there is no, I mean, when you come out of an Ayurveda college, you are told that you can do medical, surgical, gynecological, obstetrical, and medical legal kind of practices. But what is our health system role? What are we supposed to provide? And still our system continue to be a choice-based system. I mean, if it is based on patient choice, 
And of course, the ministry is you know, trying to do uh, the supply side of it and trying to inculcate that Ayush can do many things in non-communicable diseases and so on. But by and large, it is still a choice-based system. And vast variation in learning capacities of Ayush practitioners and their demand and uh, as well as expected roles in different states. Like if you look at Bihar, where we have the maximum Ayush practitioners make uh, Ayush uh, the the understanding of their health system role compared to what is in Maharashtra or in Kerala is very different. So this is there is a lot of vast variation. Now often if you look at Ayush integration in mainstream circles, it is about gap filling approach. We saw this in COVID first line treatment centers when the infrastructure was crumbling. We were asked to support through a gap-filling approach. The entire literature on human resources for health in India on Ayush is about gap-filling. There is no clear understanding. There are very few papers. And Ayush practitioners are expected to role, the play always a subordinate role, except in places like their Shrike. Now, Dr. Tanuja uh, mentioned how they are able to uh, uh, e extend their services in various ways. But this is not the case in uh, primary health centers or a co-located co centers or a civil CFLTC. We have to work in parallel or play subordinate role. So there are these parallel programs and integrative health approach is a far dream still. Inclusion of Ayurveda in mainstream protocols. I have analyzed the last 20 years of work in Kerala. There are around 15 diseases in public health system in Kerala, like adenovirus. Now we have the Nipah, the Sika, uh, we have um, chikungunya, dengue, malaria. So we can count the numbers to 15. And the, the morbidity pattern is very high in Kerala. But if you look at the documents uh, describing about Ayurveda, it will be an economic review that uh, Ayurveda is being talked about an export potential, medical tourism, and its infrastructure for that. Not in terms of the Directorate of Health Services. There is hardly any mention about an Ayurvedic protocol on chikungunya or dengue, etc. But from 2006, Ayurvedic practitioners have been consistently treating chikungunya, dengue, and now in COVID, we know how Ayurveda has been marginalized in the whole process. So in, uh, in the state task force, the minister in the le legislative assembly said that Ayurveda is doing very well. The Amritam study was very promising. And the question, uh, are you able to uh, include an Ayurvedic person in the task force? No, we haven't considered that. So you see the politics of knowledge is out in the open today. And I get very uh, kind of um, uh, nervous about these developments because uh, when we talk ourselves are Ayurvedic persons saying that we are mainstreamed now, but I think we are far away from that. So now coming to the CPHC and public health, major part of Ayurveda's development is in the private sector. In Kerala, there are 25,000 or 28,000 Ayurvedic practitioners of which around 1,500 are in the government service. The rest of are all in private sector or in NGOs and so on. Private sector alignment in public health goals is an important dimension uh, as per national health policy in India. But this has been hardly achieved. But in COVID, we experienced how in Kerala or in Tamil Nadu, where there is a larger number of Siddha doctors, how they came together to serve the public health community and the public-private partnership, there is a huge potential, but I think it needs much more political will and to put into place. In many large states where private practitioners, I don't have to tell this because all of us know that they're located mostly in small towns and cities and they tend to practice allopathy. So what is the defined role of an Ayush physician in such a state where Ayurveda is not there? In Maharashtra, an entire ambulatory service, in entire uh, critical care service is taken care of by Ayurveda. But what is that role? Are we prepared for that? Ayurveda practitioners working in such area, I mean, many places they practice mainly allopathy and they are not able to optimize their own knowledge. And private sector clinical institution, and this is my critique of Kerala, and secondary and tertiary services, as well as the pharmaceutical sector, and I'm repeating, the pharmaceutical sector have a medicalization path with limited focus on broader public health outcome at community level. Now, we know about the education. Ayurvedic education is not uh, oriented towards comprehensive primary health care or public health or UHC. It is 
on clinical medicine. We talk about clinical medicine, but experience like that of Dr. Girijas challenging the entire uh, um, uh, caucus of uh, episiotomy. I think these are not highlighted. So I think this needs a big change. And th this is evidenced in the Ayurveda College syllabus today. It is taught and provided in a limited way. The pathway in which Ayush institutions have developed, the knowledge uh, it has survived, the pharmaceutical products, if you look at, all this is uh, designed to cater to uh, not a public health physician uh, practitioner, but a clinician. And sh should we think of Ayush MD program? Or should we think of Ayush public health program as at MD level? Now, research, uh, this is a very hot topic today. Research aptitude in Ayush community is very limited, but it is emerging. And it is really uh, uh, glad to note that there is a research community uh, emerging. A lack of good evidence synthesis from public health is a major issue. Uh, because as uh, I was telling, the dengue study in Tamil Nadu, Nilabembu Kudini, how the political will transformed this is the image, or how it changed the image in Kerala for Ayurveda through chicken kuni and dengue. That's not documented because there is no protocol, there is no evidence synthesis. And if you look at the DHS guideline, it is highly focused on allopathic protocols. And economic reviews, if you look at Ayurveda, will be there, but not in public health. And there is, except in Tamil Nadu, where there is a public health cadre, the situation in most other places that um, it is at the borders of public health. And I wrote about it at the early days of epidemic, how doctors at the borders of public health are trying to get into this. And there are pilot efforts now. The Ministry of Irish is doing so many things now uh, through PHIs, the public health initiatives. And in the past also, if you look at MP NPC DCS, that is National Program for Prevention, Control, Cancer, and so on. The seven states, this program was implemented by CCRAs. But the reports are programmatic. We don't have clear evidence synthesis, but a new research community is coming. Now, COVID is a classic case. We have just written a major article on this. The learning from COVID is that even though there is a uh, there is a better public perception of Ayurveda and Siddha and so on, still I think, and yoga, with International Yoga Day, the attraction is much better today. But I think evidence-based systematic algorithms or in, for institutionally delivered care. I'm not talking about private practice. Institutionally delivered care, institutional health system integration, I think we are far away. This is the learning from COVID also. Shared standardized protocols and algorithms will help the patient from move, moving from a choice-based approach to a supply-side kind of approach. Now, what are the current criticisms, including in uh, major policy circles towards uh, Ayurveda? I think this is my last slide, or the last but one. Uh, see, the, the allopathic physicians are asking, is it system integration that you want, or you want better health outcomes? Why should we, I should be integrated? Because we already have better health outcomes. How do we challenge this? Where is the evidence for government to promote such mass application programs across the country? Maybe Ministry of Ayush is parallelly doing, but at health system level, uh, what is the evidence? That is the, another question. Public health service delivery is not a choice. This is what some doctors are saying. Why should you we, uh, leave it to people's choice? We need, it is not a choice. Public health delivery is government's prerogative. This is what, like in major epidemics, can be, uh, and uh, like uh, so many movements at the ground level, they are requesting, like we have Ayush community uh, uh, programs for immunity boosting and so on. How do we integrate this? This is the issue. Can we have patient choice and patient rights? And has Ayush got any role? Is there a clear added value for integrating or co-locating Ayush? This is uh, another critical question. Or does it only create confusion? When you say Ayush integration, how do you integrate six systems with allopathy uh, in a co-located facility? Where would the patient go? These are the questions from uh, policymakers and Ayush pra allopathic practitioners. Is there a clear mechanism framework for implementing integration? This is another question. In our system, each one has its own approach. So how do you integrate? What is the way out? Is commercial interest, the pharmaceutical interest, the medicalized interest, 
is leading to the call for integration. So in terms of, you know, before concluding, I would say that world over, if you look at the WHO policies, we are, we are in the 13th work program of WHO, which talks about emergency health res response for 1 billion, health and well-being for 1 more billion, and universal health coverage for 1 more billion. This is the 13th work program, which was in 72nd WHO World Health Assembly, uh, ratified by the member states. The question is, um, there is now, uh, based on that, the COVID has really deranged this 13th work program in a way. But there is still a specific fo focus on healthy life expectancy, more people enjoying better health and well-being, increasing focus on non-communicable diseases, and uh, a few focus on uh, newly emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases like Zika virus or Nipah or so many new things. So what is the post-COVID scenario? We are still to predict because we are, we are still in the dark. But Ayurveda has significant potential to contribute in all of these. I think we need to clearly examine how we intervene in this core services, not just in subordinate way, but in core leading, driving roles. Preventing and managing NCDs. Uh, now NHSRC and Niti Aayog is looking at this. And how do we co communicate our understanding of wellness to this lab? So to conclude, I think there is a better appreciation and understanding of Ayurveda community regarding public health, population, and community health. This is a really welcome development. So many Ayush practitioners are today doing public health. There are over 60 public health programs in the country. But when they go back, they go into mainstream public health. They don't do research on our system. This is very unfortunate. There is a growing understanding of the socio-economic and environmental determinants and their interconnectedness. These were the original principles of Almata, intersectorality, etc. And health and wellness is coming up through this inherent intersectoral approach. We need to talk about food. We need to talk about nutrition. We need to talk about integration of millets and PDS and so on and so forth. There is broadening of largely medicalized view uh, and it to uh, an interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary research approach. That's also a welcome thing. But we can see that Ayurveda is still marginalized in systems engagement, in health systems engagement. And we have seen that in COVID-19. The politics of knowledge is out in the open. In, so what we need to strive for is instead of leaving it for development of Ayurveda to patient choice, I think we need to develop a plan uh, strategy based on the demographic profile. And uh, Dr. Girija mentioned about it so beautifully. And uh, thank you very much for that. And the morbidity patterns, contextual needs of various states and regions, because it differs so much. And building a health system role in each system of medicine, developing appropriate skills through uh, our BAMS and MD programs uh, for better health outcomes. So once again, thank you very much to the organizers for this. And uh, I'm very humbled by the presence of so many of my teachers in this forum. So my pronouns to everyone. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for the broader perspective you put on a medical pluralism and the challenges and the roadmap with the prime concern of health. And uh, rightly said, you actually spelled out very well that Krishna Kumar, you always wanted Ayurveda to be in the mainstream medical practice. Thank you, sir, for this wonderful session. We now move on to the next session, Ayurveda in Public Health Policy Perspective uh, by Dr. Vinayak Padikil, who is a surveillance officer, medical officer at World Health Organization, New Delhi. Vinayak, sir, is a public health expert and is an advisor in preventive and promotive health action and environmental health. Sir? Yeah. Am I audible? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Very much. Okay. You can share the screen if you have a presentation. Sure, sure, sure. Is it visible? Sir, very much. Please okay. go ahead, sir. Uh, um, 
first of all i would like to thank everyone uh, who decided to organize such an event uh, remembering krishna kumar ji uh, a revolutionary leader for all of us uh, who always inspires us who always lit the fire in us and i am humbled uh, to be called for such a uh, dignified occasion and i would like to uh, thank for all those people who have been listening patiently for all this days uh, i there are so many people who i consider at my guru sthana in this meeting pranams to all i'll go directly to my presentation so i had an issue with how to go about with this discussion because i have been placed in the fourth uh, place and i know star wars like girja ma'am uh, unikrishna sir and jayendra sir are there and i wanted to choose a topic in such a way that that doesn't collide with others and i couldn't have a discussion with all of them so i thought like i'll go with a global perspective as and luckily it turns out to be a very nice presentation to end with uh, actually i like to thank dr girija ma'am to put out a very good local in action perspective uh, how to build upon with a medical pluralism by unikrishna sir and i'll just get on to uh, a global perspective this whole presentation is basically based upon the traditional medicine strategy of wcho uh, so that we will have an idea how the world sees uh, a medical system of like ayurveda and how we are supposed to be equipped ourselves to achieve or go beyond the challenges which the or the opportunities we have ahead of in the future so this is actually traditional the whole world calls ayurveda and every other medical systems as traditional complementary or alternative medicines or as newly called as traditional complementary and integrative medicine in the global scenario uh, except from almata who has actually specifically worked on two strategic papers which is like on 2002 to 2005 and 2014 to 2023 the first i'll just get on with the context like why this traditional medicine strategy was needed all around the world if you see and hear about traditional medicine you should have an idea you should have an idea about how we are going to uh, see the whole scenario in around the world of traditional medicines traditional medicines can be anything like ayurveda which is very coded which is having a very good system how we plan it uh, with a very proper systematic medical information education system and can be something like a very small uh, massage method or or healing technique or a herbal medical system in any part of the world so all of them are clubbed together into one pack and they are called as traditional or complementary and integrative medicines in this scenario when you hear about this all around the world there is an uncritical enthusiasm like for some medical systems in their own place and there is some kind of skepticism which is because maybe because of not properly informed about the same so in this scenario there was also three four reasons like around the world there is an increase in the use of traditional and complementary medicine due to the fear of side effects uh the adverse conditions and emotions against the way the medical industry has grown the biomedical industry has grown in this scenario if you look into it see if take you scenario in africa around 80% of the population has dependency on traditional or complementary medical systems china has around 40% and this is the scenario around as girija ma'am has put in the early slides india has around 65% at least once in life so the, there are so many different factors in different countries which led people to get on to this medical systems and around the world in the developed world countries people are looking for alternative options and there is an increased popularity for the same and healthcare nowadays is not just curing disease healthcare as who has put it's a holistic approach where physical spiritual mental every 
aspect of a human is taken care of. So in these all scenarios, there came a need that you cannot avoid accepting the traditional medical systems all over the world. So the strategy was brought in. The first strategy actually discusses about four basic points in which one is policy, where the governments are supposed to try and bring in the medical systems into part of national health policy of the country. The second issue is to address the safety, efficacy and quality of the services, products and the practitioners of any medical systems which belongs to TCI. Access, access is a big issue and actually if you take a scenario, the number of people who actually depend on traditional and medical systems around Africa, it's around 2000, 1 to 200 in traditional systems, whereas for modern system, there is like, uh, there is one doctor for around 20,000 population. So there is an access issues and actually as Sar has put in India, sadly, our health system is majorly used as a human resource thing. So this access issue is also a part of strategy. Rational use of medical prescribed medicines in uh, traditional format is also another strategy which was put on by this. And as I said early, uh, towards a working definition, uh, there has been several practices followed around the world and the whole summed up knowledge systems of all the traditional, spiritual or systematic coded heritage systems together are called up as traditional medicines and around there are so many techniques, so many practices which are used in different systems which are coordinated and collated to bring in a definition for the scene. So integration of the traditional medical system to the health, the national health system is one of the major agenda which was put out for addressing the issues of traditional medical systems to be accept and bring in the expense. So WSU brings in three models of integration of the same. The first one becoming the integrative method, which is actually is a proper system where there are different medical systems and the traditional medical system has all the real value addition process and power in the system compared to with uh, many other countries. For example, in China, Korea or Vietnam, you have systems which actually gives you methods as far as a biomedical system and you have the workforce, you have the education system, you have the research and developments of, and policy regulation mechanisms separately supporting the whole systems in an equivalent manner. The inclusive system is a kind of system where there is integration happening, but not at every level. Inclusive can be like you have a health policy document which says that you, you have systems to establish, but there is no way to cover, for example, there is no health insurance coverage for uh, treatment done through a traditional medical system or there is no assessment mechanisms to see whether the policies are properly implemented or regulated. Tolerance system is kind of a very vague system where the government is having a prominent medical system, but they are okay to support any other medical support systems by law. And they don't give any much emphasis for the system. We are actually during the time when this document was made, India was not part of uh, integrative, but sadly we were in an inclusive system where we had some criteria and supporting systems, but we are not actually taking the national health policy prerogatives towards uh, Indian system that is Aish. Then 2014 and 23, the document which came uh, for the traditional medical system, uh, it had a lot of, the government started bringing in a lot of efforts to address that there is a, a alternative or traditional medical system in the country, 
because actually people do go for it and when they started going behind it they found a lot of issues like policy regulation like how to develop a policy for the same how to regulate it integration what kind of standardization evaluation or mechanism can be brought in so that the traditional medical systems of the state country can be integrated to the existing national health policies safety and quality there are a lot of issues how to assess the safety and quality of the products processes services and the qualifications of the practitioners there is no methodology to or evaluation techniques to assess the efficacy of the drugs so these were big major issues amongst many along with that there are so many claims and advertisements many of the traditional medical system makes and there are no way to assess as of now or to regulate the same big lack of research and development education and training of tra traditional uh, complementary medical practitioners are not standardized and regulated at par with the other prominent biomedical systems in the world information communication and the ability to share as uh, umigrishna sir very clearly put it out we have uh, girijam ma'am actually put out a lot of examples we were not able to information and communication systems we, we were not able to communicate the same or bring in behavioral change in the people by sharing the information properly so these were issues found by the nation states so the objectives of the 2014 to 23 traditional medical strategy was to build on knowledge base on traditional and complementary integrative medicines tci medicines building and the same to be imbibed into the national health policy strengthen the quality how to improve the quality and measures of the same promotion of universal health coverage as part of the sdgs and use of traditional medicines to achieve uhcs so for this they were they made three strategies and action plans for the same action guides to achieve these objectives uh, help and design strategic plans which use these three objectives to be practically implemented in the country and help the governments around the world to build upon a strategic plan for the country based on their capacity their needs and their system of health and medical systems are prevailing there and there was a review plan implemented into the whole strategy where the government will do the who level review revision will be done how the strategic plans like implementing the tra traditional medical knowledge into the national health policy or how quality assurance is being implemented in a country or how traditional medicine is used to promote universal health coverage for everyone and this mid level review plan was also implemented into the system so i sir said that i don't want to go much to the medical pluralism medical pluralism is a concept very clearly and beautifully explained by unikrishnan sir in the scenario i want to give some examples of medical pluralistic scenarios around the world as in the, which are called by may jin chan in his paper as interpenetrative pluralism exclusionary pluralism and subjugatory pluralism this is very simple these are three medical system existing in three countries china korea and japan for us to understand where our government and our systems are using the integration of traditional medical systems into the health system national health policy interpenetrative pluralism is a method where the, the government gives equivalent and same level of commitment and support to two separate medical systems that is biomedical system and the traditional medical system in the scenario chinese medicine and there is a freedom given to both system to cross the borders and interconnect and do the kind of practice level interventions by mixing up and making different kind of promotive solutions and healthcare outcomes which is needed for the society whereas exclusionary pluralism which is present in korea is more of a similar kind of system 
where both the medical system, the traditional medical system and the biomedical medical system are given same importance and same support, but they are not allowed to intermingle. They are maintained strictly as two different parallel systems without a point of contact. They perform and develop in their own ways without any interactions. Subjugatory pluralism is kind of an example in Japan where which can be also seen around our country where the medical system is actually as Ridupriya madam has put in the it's undemocratically asymmetrical. The, there is a very big asymmetry where the biomedical system is predominant and the traditional medical system is made dependent and subjugated by the prominent biomedical system. So this scenario is uh, which we have in our country is more like a subjugatory pluralism. So we need to actually go beyond and think about how we want to take our own actions to so solve these issues. And at 2019, there is a WHO global report which reviewed what is happening around the world. It showed as in all, around the world, there is an increased acceptance for national level traditional and complementary medical systems. There has been around 107 countries which actually implemented national policy, implemented traditional and complementary medicine into their national policy. There has been increased infrastructure on governance among member states. Member, all the countries had an interest to implement a better infrastructure on governance, like building a national research institute in their place, have a national health policy committee, like a ministerial board or a technical support system in every member states. And it was around eight in 1919, which go around to 98 by 2018. So, Incorporation of herbal drugs to national, as many as 40 African nations were able to incorporate herbal drugs into their national essential medical list. Countries like Ghana were able to bring a special herbal essential medical list from, from their country level. So these kind of encouraging positive support systems has been happening for traditional medicine all around the world. So, this, this slide shows that in the member states, according to the population, the type of traditional and complementary medical system is used in the decreasing order. If you look, we, we are having around 93% percent of people, number of M member states who are interested and supportive of Ayurvedic medicine compared to many other medical systems, we need to have a robust plan to go about and establish a much better robust system. So this is where I want to bring in the condition that we are not alone. The whole world, every major traditional and complementary medical systems they are trying to imbibe and bring in much more needed enthusiasm to their system. So if we are actually on a right trajectory, but we need to increase our momentum, otherwise there is going to be a scenario where we might miss the bus. So if you look at the data which says the challenges member states all around the world faced in implementing traditional and complementary medical system, these issues are kind of very similar to those issues which we face in our country too. Lack of resource data, lack of financial support, lack of mechanism to monitor safety of traditional and complementary medical products and practices, lack of, edu lack of education and training in traditional and complementary medical system practitioners, monitoring and regulation of providers and drugs, lack of cooperation, between channels at national health authority, lack of mechanism to monitor safety of products, and we don't have much mechanism to regulate advertisements and claims. So if you look into the scenario that these priorities and these problems and these challenges 
all around the world for traditional medical systems looks much similar for us. As Sir has very clearly put out, in the scenario, what we had, we had start like popula- uh, started policy level discussions in 1946 when the Borer Committee started working and gave their recommendations in 48 before the independence. 83, but Bore Committee was very clear that the traditional medicine is something which uh, provincial decision making can make and do it. So it was very westernized in its concept. And in 1983, National Health Purpose, actually, as Sar said, our policy documents very clearly mention Irish medical system as a supportive workforce for the biomedical uh, health system. So this is a very uh, unfortunate scenario, which actually is going for a long time. And 2002 NSP reports consider and reiterate the same. And this actually culminated in having NHM National Rural Health Mission in 2005 to integrate workforce into health system. And this, as uh, Munikrishan Sara has put it out already, we had a lot of use, but all this use was, we have been used, uh, our workforce was used by the National Health Mission, but not for the purpose of integrating or strengthening Irish medical system, but as a workforce to provide the services of the mainstream biomedical system. Uh, we had Department of Indian System of Medicine coming in 1995 and Irish medical med- department coming up in 2003 and department of ministry of Ayush coming in 2014. So the growth compared to other countries, we are on a good track, but we, uh, if you look at, we have a national Ayush mission at the national level now we, and states like Kerala have made Kerala Ayush health policy. But if you look as universities are put the Kerala Ayush health policy, is more oriented towards making Ayush, uh, Ayurveda as a global brand and bringing much more tourism money rather than supporting and caring the health system, ailing health system of Kerala, which is continuously under attack by several advent of new epidemics and epidemi- uh, pandemics. So, in this scenario, my whole discussion ends up with certain few points. And this points is that around the world, globally, there is an increased interest for traditional and complementary medicine. Nationally, we have a lot of stress for eye system from the government support. Is this enough? No. We have a lot of problems. There is similar enthusiasm for traditional and complementary medicine around the world. If you look in the traditional complementary scenario in the world, we are outrun by the Chinese medical system in much bigger way, manner. So we are in a scenario of trying to globalize the system. And in that scenario, we need to have two things, two, three things in our side, which are to be used as positive for our establishments. We need to have a very clear policy regulation method for our system. And we need to have a proper research system which is growing up to upscale any kind of idea. The problem with Indian health system not accepting traditional system is we have been doing a pretty good work in COVID. We had done a lot of good work in Dengue and Chikungunya as SARS suggested. But we don't have a clear cut programmatic implementation strategic SOP for any kind of Tengu or Chikungunya using Siddha or Aish Ayurveda medical systems. So we need to work on bringing up upscaling models of traditional based systems. If you take the Girja Ma'am's example, that's a very classical example of using very small intervention to bring out massive change on the nutrition problems of the government country which is one of the major largest agenda of the government. We need to bring out a lot of division of labor into the system in such a way that we don't need a Vaidya, be a doctor, B 
be a researcher, be a professor, be a spokesperson and burden them to work on to every aspect of Ayurveda. We need to have Ayurveda doctors moving out of the system, learning and integrating inter interesting methodologies and bringing it and helping in reviving and establishing a proper health system which will support the tradition uh, Aish medical systems. We need to bring ourselves out of, as mentioned earlier, the subjugatory pluralistic method where we need to depend upon our health system. If you take a district level power, the district is run by a district medical officer or a district health officer who is actually from a biomedical system and all other systems are compelled to work under the guidance of deficiency or decision making and wins and fancies of these people. So this scenario should be broken down so that we need to have our own access and establishments to bring in the worth of Irish medical research and the practices. These things are very much important and we don't need to worry. Internationally, there is a very uh, increased enthusiasm. So social media banters in clubhouse groups are not something which we need to worry much about but about the lethargy, complacency of lack of proactiveness, if we have, that is something which we need to work about. Concluding this thing, we hope these kind of platforms be a point of interaction and importance to build up a scenario that Aish can become a global leader in traditional complementary medicine. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for detailing on various health aspects and then regulation and the issues and the way ahead. Thank you so much for enlightening us. So we now move forward to the discussions and I invite a partner association. Um, first, I may I invite Dr. Vijay Nangili, who is the Ayurveda Hospital Management Association, is the president of uh, Ayurveda Hospital Management Association. So can you please sum up, sir, for today? Thank you. Can I have audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please go ahead. My dear doctors, friends, and other dignitaries present here today. Good afternoon, everyone. Patma Sri, Sri Dr. Jaya Krishna Umar was not just a friend to me. He was also a person who filled me with positive vibes. When I saw and talked to him, the face with the smiling grow will never be forgotten. Krishna Umarji and I studied at the Shornur Samajam Ayurveda College. He was my senior. That we peers, he has been very happy to renew friendships and at all time, all meetings since the formation of Alumni Association. He was also the patron of Ayurveda Hospital Management Association. He was a great person who introduced Ayurveda to the world. He worked hard for the growth of Ayurveda by intervening in government. Always love and affection for everyone. The ceremony Samarpana 2021 being conducted in memory of Krishna Maharaji is being organized from 17th to 23rd September. And in today's session, we are dealing with Ayurveda practice. I am very happy to be the part of this interactive session, which is discussing Ayurveda practice. Changes in the field of Ayurveda practice and the changes need to be made should be discussed. Nowadays, public health needs to be protected with side, effect, side effects. That is why Ayurveda. 
I wish Samarpana 2021 a good guide in the field of Ayurveda. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, Samarpana. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. We now invite uh, Dr. Raju Thomas, who is the President, Ayurveda Medical Association of India. Uh, please say a few words. Thank you, madam. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Good evening, one and all. Respected Dr. Tanija Nesari, madam, and uh, respected speakers and all participants from various parts. At the very outset, I pay my humble pronouns to the fond memories of Krishna Maharaj. As all of us know, Krishna Maharaj was a great visionary with a clear idea about what should be and how should be the Ayurveda of today and tomorrow's. Uh, Krishna Maharaj firmly believed that Ayurveda can do wonders and can make and can make huge uh, donations to the betterment of the humanity. His mission was to groom the Ayurvedic fraternity to catch his goals. I think he was very particular regarding the Ayurvedic educational sector, so he preached about the Gurugula system. He was an advocate of that. He was particular about the uh, quality of the medicines we uh, provide to the patients, the services rendered to the patients and so on. He was always uh, eager to, or he ensured the quality high quality in each and every sector he was engaged in. And now, as a practitioners and beneficiaries of Ayurveda, it is our duty to work hard and to place Ayurveda in high esteem as envisaged by Krishna Martin. I think now the whole world is, uh, as uh, earlier demonstrated by Dr. Vinayak and uh, Dr. Unikrishna, the whole world is uh, looking towards the traditional medical systems the pandemic uh, conditions such as the COVID has made a massive shift in the health concept of the whole world. I think more and more people are uh, seeking our support or other traditional medicines, even though even if it is for uh, in the preventive measures or in the curative measures or as well as in the rehabilitative uh, sector. And we are sure that we have Ayurveda has an answer in each and every sector, whether it is uh, in the preventive or in the uh, curative sector. We have an answer and uh, we have a solution. But um, due to many hazards, I think, uh, especially like the state in states like Kerala, we are not gaining uh, such a and the official support. We are not gaining, and the. Situation is, and the focus of our, the onus is now upon us to have a, we have to work hard and to have develop new methods and new approaches to place Ayurveda in the light light. I think the previous speakers have already narrated the key points regarding the uh, Ayurveda practice in nowadays. The presentations were excellent and uh, relevant in the current global health scenario. Uh, Dr. Girija and uh, Katie Jayavishan has made uh, excellent uh, presentations regarding the Ayurveda practice. While the uh, presentations of Dr. Unnikrishnan and uh, Dr. Vinayak were excellent, uh, particularly in the present health scenario globally. And I, on behalf of Ayurveda Medical Association of India, congratulate the organizers before, behind this uh, Summer Plan 2021, a fitting tribute to Krishna Marji. And I convey my attitudes for inviting me to this uh, program. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for uh, this wonderful uh, commemoration, actually. Uh, I invite Dr. Vijit KV, who is an executive member, Private uh, Ayurveda Medical Practitioners Association. Okay. So, I uh, think he's not available. So, we'll now, um, I, we have some announcements to make. Uh, the documentary on Krishna Kumarji, the G, the plural being, has now been released on YouTube. Please go and watch. And uh, we have one more announcement for tomorrow. Um, as we have, well, we are summing up for today. Tomorrow, we have an interactive session on Ayurveda research. 
with the Partner Association of Indian Medical Indian System of Medicines, represented by Dr. Aravind, medical officer. Uh, Indian System of Medicine, represented by Dr. Shaiju. Uh, PG scholars, represented by Dr. Isra. Uh, inaugural address will be by Dr. Bhushan Patwardhan. And the topics go on with the road till now by Dr. Somit Kumar. A research vision for Ayurveda by Dr. Rama Jaisundar, government initiatives by Dr. Srikant, and the path that lies ahead by Dr. P. Ramanopar. So, uh, as we are done for today, we are now moving towards the end of the session. Thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate and uh, highly uh, congratulate the presenters for taking their valuable time off and being with us and especially Tanuj and Esri, ma'am, thank you so much for joining us from the start and being until now joining us here uh, and also uh, for um, wholeheartedly that you have been very initial the speakers have been really enthusiastic and uh, thank you so much for this kind support uh, the dear audience uh, we expect your support to be extended towards us for the next few days also thank you so much for joining us today we wind up for today and please uh, do stay with us tomorrow at 3 p.m thank you so much namaste